All right, for segment one today, we're going to continue on with absolute power into the uh, book one system. And we're going to talk today actually about the system. We're going to talk about die rolling, and we're going to talk a little bit after that about combat. And there are going to be some pages here with some nice little charts and so forth. Very, very, very simple charts. This game can be played with two pages of notes. That's it. Big, colorful anime superhero looking notes so we will take a look at that here in just a second get that off the screen where is it there it is that took forever it did. <laughs> like i clicked it and i was like go go so oh yeah hey be sure to like subscribe share and of course if you want to donate we got paypal got ko-fi oh get wow again what is up stream labs StreamYard, whatever you are. I'm <laughs> reading Streamlabs. It's just going to be that kind of day, isn't it? Oh, you did that. All right, well, let's look at the book, because apparently I am just off my rocker right now. Um, and I can't find my notes. So it's chapter seven. So where are we here? Do, 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 do. We're going to start here, page 165. Taking action. So the TriStat system is pretty simple. You have three stats. You take those numbers, you mash them together. That's your that's your total, and then you roll dice to try to meet that total. And it's uh, usually two six siders, but it can be three. You can have uh, they're not boons and banes. What are they called in here? Merits and Ed? No, that uh, we'll we'll find out in a moment. I forget what they're called, but they're basically boons and banes. Where you can actually have extra dice added to it or dice taken away to meet that uh, that goal. It's that simple. Don't overthink it. It's meant to be something where you figure out what's going on. You get a quick number, you roll it, and you move on with the story. In role-playing games, what's that? Let's see how it's done. Well, in role-playing games like Absolute Power, most character NPC actions do not require any particular rules. A player simply states that the character walks across the room, picks up an object, drives a vehicle, talks to someone, etc. If the GM agrees that the action is possible and can be performed without much difficulty, it simply happens. Yeah. <laughs> Personal interaction between characters or NPCs is at the heart of RPGs, and this is what sets them apart from other tabletop games such as board miniature and party games. The players and GM will spend most of their role-playing time talking in character and describing what their alter egos are doing from scene to scene. In addition to speaking with the voice of all background and supporting characters they control, Game Masters also describe what the player characters are seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting. Notice it doesn't say what the characters are doing. That's your job as the player character to provide context and understanding for the character's action. Uh, da -da -da, hold on a second, I'm looking at chat here. Yeah, so I didn't just start. No, it's been going on for uh, hour or for a half hour now, but violence, if you didn't see my tweet, yeah, yes, yesterday it StreamYard or Friday StreamYard and Rumble were not talking to each other. I kept getting various different errors about corrupted data or unable to connect. So that's why you didn't see it on Friday. So Twitch and YouTube work just fine. All right, taking action. Throughout the course of a game, circumstances may arise where specific rules can help determine what happens. This is usually the case when the outcome of an action or event is uncertain and the result is important to the story. I wouldn't even say to the story. You can shorten that sentence more, but this is it, the most important sentence in this book when it comes to rolling dice. Outcome of the action or event is unknown, uncertain in this case, and the result, the term I use is uh, me meaning, the result of the success or failure is meaningful. So the result is important. If that is the case, then roll. If it is neither uncertain nor meaningful slash important, don't roll. Say yes if it's probable, say no if it's probably not, and move on. If a character needs to fix a broken reactor pump to prevent a nuclear meltdown, can he do it in time? If a character's, uh, character's car drives off a cliff, can he jump clear in time? Probably not. Uh, and if not, oh, this is a superhero game, probably. Yeah, probably can. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and if not, how badly will the crash injure the character? If two metahumans fight, who wins? That's the best time for dice. When two characters are going at, again, PCs, NPCs, whatever, are trying to counter each other, hmm, who wins? Well, that's when the dice really shine. A character's stats 
attributes, skill groups, and derived values help resolve these dramatic questions. In many cases, dice dice rolls? Do they do the British dice thing in the singular? They probably do. They're Canadian. Okay. Uh, the it's, it's just hard for me to say. <laughs> the dice rolls represents elements beyond the direct control of the character or the uncertainty that results when opposing characters interact. In some situations, the GM may elect to determine the results without rolling dice. The GM may do so if he thinks a particular outcome is certain. We just talked about that. Or yeah. a particular outcome is dramatically necessary to the game. I don't like the last one. I know there are some people out there who live by it, think it's perfectly fine. I don't. I believe in a concept called emergent storytelling, which means the dice create that portion of the story. Now, if you think that, you know, if Heathen Dog thinks, you know, for example, it's just common sense. This is what the result of it is. Then don't roll dice. I get that. It just happens. Right. But I am not going to give you, you know what? That was so cool. We're not even going to roll dice. No. <laughs> I might say that was so cool. Highly unexpected by the opposing side or wh whatever you're affecting. I'll give you a bonus, but you're still going to roll dice. That's, that's my way. Uh, if, uh, if, if Rumble had a way to save the streams for members or followers, subscribers, whatever only, I would absolutely, I cannot talk, I would absolutely save those streams. But they don't. So, um, what, and, and if they're, uh, what do you call it? The, the bridge that they used to have with YouTube, this is a YouTube problem, not a Rumble problem. If YouTube would let them pull, like Odyssey used to do, like BitChute used to do, and there's one more, I forget what it is, uh, then again, we'd have no problem. But uh, YouTube is putting blockers on that, so there's nothing, there was nothing we can do. I'm not downloading the videos and then reloading them. That's the way I do it. It's the way it's just going to have to be, so. Anywho, uh, one situation the rules cover in greater detail is combat. Why do you think that is, Heathen Dog? Well, because combat is usually the 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 place where you need the most random die rolls to actually create, you know, a a, a thrilling conflict. Right, and it's also where there's the most. Mm, don't know if that works or not. Yeah, I got. You know, I attempt to punch Heathen Dog. Do I? I mean, I would love to say yes, and of course he'd love to say no. Or have a force field or any number of yeah. superhero things that could happen. Oh, that's right. He could be the Flash, and I could have just punched air. Yeah, it's I'm gone. But you were right there, but now I'm not. <laughs> so, so the game mechanics for physical conflict are explicit to give players greater control over their characters' actions when engaged in a mortal struggle. If they lose, they'll know the GM has not arbitrarily injured or killed their characters. The GM can also follow a similar procedure with any other action that affect a character's fate. Treat routine activities in passing and delve into more detail whenever an action impacts a character's physically or emotionally. Kind of a weird sentence there. I thought it was going to go somewhere else, but routine actions just don't roll. You dr Unless there's a reason why you can't drive to work today, you drive to work. I've driven to work for, what, four years now in this location. I've had one accident because a stupid hubcap came flying up off the road and, and mashed the front of my truck. It was one of those things that, what, what are you supposed to do? It's flying around and it hit the front of my truck. And that happened what, earlier this year, I think it was. So that's a weird event that maybe a driving role or, hmm, did something weird random happen to you on the way to work if you really think it's important to put in there. But every day, even in this nonsense traffic that I have to deal with in Montgomery, Alabama, I, uh, I make it just fine. You shouldn't have to roll unless there's a reason to. Please don't make me roll every day. Because even on percentile dice, your averages are something's going to happen once every 100 days. Well, that doesn't happen. <laughs> no. Uh, all right. Describing actions. Ooh, here we go. Characters can perform or attempt a nearly endless list of actions. Well, these can be mundane activities, talking, breathing, thinking. Why? Okay, whatever. Skilled activities. Move on, move on. Move on. I am sure. skilled activities, building a suit of power armor, hacking sure. into a computer, moving silently, climbing the side of a building, sure. or combat activities, fighting, dodging, shooting a weapon, firing searing eye beams. Awesome. Right? <laughs> Good. I always thought Cylons should have that. They really should have. <laughs> yeah, too. I mean... Yeah, Kit, Kit had the whole Cylon thing going on. Why oh, yeah, that's right. 
Okay, anyway, every GM has a preferred method for having players describe their actions, their character's actions. This usually involves the GM moving from player to player and asking, what is your character doing? Okay, for beginners, yes. That To me, that's actually... I don't, I don't like that method, but to start, if you've never played before, there you go. What are you doing? I hate the what are you doing thing with experienced players, though. You should know that you're in the game. You should always be in the game. And once the game master is done describing the narrative or scene, whether you roll initiative first, which I think is silly unless there's a reason to do, oh, this guy has to go first or whatever, just start saying what your character's doing. Experienced GMs try to give each person equal role playing what? Equal role playing time. Mm. Well, you try. It said try. Mm. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. It sometimes doesn't work out that way because of either the situation or the player. But if the if the game master is giving you the opportunity to shine at least once per game session, I'm yes. cool with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess that's that's my take on it. I don't give equal time, but absolutely, I will always, at least, maybe not every session, but through the course of a, of a adventure or campaign, every character, every player character is going to have a moment to shine. Without a, Even if I have to ham fist it somehow. Yeah, you just got to grab it. Uh, players are responsible for relating their character's intended actions to the GM, who describes the result of those actions or requests a stat or skill roll to determine the outcome. Consider the three action description below. My character, Caliburn, is going to search for the missing Thulean artifact. <laughs> I keep looking at that like it's a misspelling. I know, I'm thinking, the e? What's the E doing in there? Okay, that, that's, that's Kanadistanian. <laughs> My character, Caliburn, is going to search for the missing Thulean artifact in the sewers beneath the Olympian Tower. Okay, now we're getting a little more specific. Sure, sure. My character, Caliburn, is going to search for the missing Thulean artifact using a thorough grid-like pattern in the sewers beneath the Olympian Tower. He has the time, so he'll use his toolkit to bypass any old metal grates as necessary. Okay, all of these seem to be getting more and more specific, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the game is going to say, okay, the more specific you are, the higher the probability you have of success. I'm hoping. All three accounts involve Caliburn looking for a missing artifact, but the level of detail is quite different. You should not be overly concerned with detail if it is irrelevant to your character's actions. So this is exactly how Caliburn is bypassing any lock rate obstacle counters in the final description. But sometimes a little detail can greatly alter the GM's interpretation of the event. I mean, uh, I get... if the, especially the last one. The, the last one says looking for in the sewer. Well, yep. if it's not hidden in the sewer, you're just going to automatically fail. But if it is hidden in the in the sewer, then you have a greater chance of success because you're focusing your attention on, on where it is. Yeah, there's a lot of things that come. So this first one doesn't say sewer, right? So he's just going to right. search for the artifact. So that'd be like that, a regular that, roll. That's when you have to go back and forth in the area, in the sky. I mean, obviously, a lot of this can be de determined by the narration that's going on outside. Okay, this one here, it's in the sewer. Well, it doesn't matter... How many rolls he makes if it's not in the sewer? He's not going to find it. <laughs> and here, grid-like pattern, well, that makes sure that, hey, he's for sure going to do it. Now, as a game master, I might say, you know what? This is going to take you uh, two extra days to do, but, but I'm going to give you a plus two to your roll. Exactly, because you're being so thorough. So if it yeah. is in the sewer, by God, you're probably going to find it. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And by the way, I said plus two just, just to blurt they're something out. Yeah. Um, all right, here we go. Look how easy this game is. It's got big, colorful, well, some black and white, in, in fancy font pictures for you, and even spells meters backwards. Okay, uh, it says jumping. I'm, I'm seeing disintegrating. I don't know about jumping. <laughs> well, I'm he does seeing, both. oh my God, this is, this is Terminator, and I'm caught in an explosion. That, that's what that looks like to me, not jumping. Well, he, he does both. Okay, yeah. Fair. He's disintegrating as he's jumping. Fair enough. That, that's the one use power, by the way. <laughs> uh, hedging rolls. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, swimming. Game rounds each. So they're all three to four seconds. Speed conversion. One kilometer per hour is one meter per round. Funny how uh, uh, metric system works. And then it talks about edges. And so when you get extra dice. And this hand, don't let this graph... This is just for people who really like numbers. Yeah, people who like the numbers just want want to see it all plotted out. 
to so so they, they can get their most efficient role possible. If you don't care about that, you don't have to care about that. And then the dice rolls. And we talked about some of this already, if I remember correctly, but uh, we'll show it on the screen. Uh, ACV versus DCV, you roll, and the highest number wins. So either you get kicked in the face or you're dodging away from the leg without a foot in the face. Yeah. This person here, well, sorry. That's bad. That's bad. <laughs> uh, this person, well, he'll need a wheelchair. And then your target numbers. What's that? He lost his legs. <laughs> just like, uh, target numbers here are the, probably the most important thing for us to look at. A simple, easy average. So average is 12, right? Now, for a superhero, an average task is what? It's mundane. At least within his superpower specialty. So you're not going to see a lot of superheroes doing average things, because that would be the police. Unless you're playing a, a normal level... You know, a normal then you are point the police. Toward, then you are the police, yeah. You're going to be doing things that are up here. So you're going to want those extra dice and those extra modifiers to help you out. And then weapon ranges, this uh, matches up with the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have an attribute with a rank of four, it can go one kilometer. So if your the gun... The level of your power indicates yeah. its range. For the most part, I mean, I'm I'm sure each power has some way of changing that up to make it more realistic or or not game breaking. But this is your basic chart. Yes. Um. Well, really, it sticks to this somehow. But remember, these are superpowers, and uh, you weren't here for the last time when we did this because you were, you know, on your sabbatical to the Bahamas. Uh, mm -hmm. But we talked about limiters and enhancements and how they work. So yes. All right. Uh, how far am I going with this first video? Where's my note card? I lost my new cards. Oh, there they are. Is that I a Thaco go chart? No, no, it's not. <laughs> That'd be awesome well. if it was. Oh, wow, we got a ways to go. Oof. Okay. Zoom in. Thank you. Uh, all right, game time. In the in-game passive retirement in a role-playing game is fluid, just as just as it is in a story. In some situations, such as conversations between two characters, the flow of game time normally matches real-world time. More often, the amount of time that passes depends on the character's activities as set by the player's actions. Things happen as soon as dramatically appropriate. Climbing a mountain may take just a few short minutes of description or a few dice, die rolls. Well, now he did die roll. I don't know. To resolve. It does not take the many hours that climbing a mountain would really take. The GM so should fun. telescope time until something interesting happens. Oh, the one one time people are going to be angry about that. Two weeks pass while you investigate the crime, and and this is generally how it's how it's done. Yes, but uh, you know you make a roll, and that roll takes that amount of time. So if you fail it, yeah, you wasted two weeks. Now some games will do things like, well, you only lose half the time, whatever. Who cares? But generally speaking, you're still losing that time. You don't roll and say, well, at least now I don't have to waste that two weeks. No, you're. This is what you're doing for two weeks while the other characters do something else or help you or whatever it happens to be. So if you're climbing a mountain that takes you know a day to climb, that's your day. So, then the mastermind behind it broadcasts a message announcing his plans to destroy Empire City if his demands are not met. GMs may go back in time as well to employ flashback scenes, which are useful tools to establish the background for a story without simply recounting the information in dry fashion. There are definitely opinions about this. I am for this. If used very, very conservatively. Mm hmm I yeah. think they absolutely do help. I know some people 100% rule them out. No, I think there are occasions when you can do this. In uh, in Star Trek D6, I think they call them cutscenes. Mm -hmm. I am for the cutscenes if used very, very sparingly. But, you know, your mileage may vary. Finally, in, ve in very dramatic situations such as combat, the GM may keep very precise track of time by using individual combat rounds. Right, Which, scene, as we just or, saw, was, what did, what did it say, three to four seconds? Yeah, uh, yes. Yep. Three, com uh, three common measures of game time are a dramatic scene, a round, and an initiative. Oh, that's a time for, okay. Well, we'll a dramatic scene is any situation where events 
remain linked moment to moment. So, okay, yeah, that could be a few seconds or it could be an hour of back and forth negotiation or something. Sure. Think of it in comic terms. A scene lasts until the panel cut panels cut to an entirely new setting, potentially with new characters. Yeah, yep. got it. A round is a measure of a time of approximately three to four seconds in length, while an initiative is one specific moment in time. That seems unnecessary to me, but maybe it's not, so I'm not going to complain. I'm just saying, to me, it seems unnecessary. But It, it seems like uh, like the whole round is when everyone goes, yeah, when everyone uses their action, but initiative is when is the moment in that round where one person is using oh so he's replacing turn the word turn or phase or whatever with initiative got it okay that's that's fine i okay okay a round is primarily used for combat situations and is the amount of time in which an average person can react to a situation make a decision and perform a significant action during a battle or other stressful situation yeah okay when combat occurs, characters roll initiative, and each character is allowed to act in order of his initiative, uh, with higher initiative going before lower initiative. All right, that's a typical game stuff, but if you've never played one before, and this is your first RPG, well, first of yeah. all, interesting, uh, and apparently you like superheroes. Good on you. A- absolute Good on you. Absolute power uses six standard dice known as affectionately, oh, affectionately as 2d6. I feel like he's writing an old 1990s Air Force EPR. I know, right? Affectionately, <laughs> it's it's two dice, man. I don't know what... I, I'm not affectionate. I'm familiar, but I'm not affectionate. When a random number needs to be generated, two dice are usually rolled. See, edge... Oh, edges and obstacles. That's what it's called. It to get, yeah. Uh, but adding the numbers shown on each die, values between 2 and 12 are generated. Now, you might be saying to yourself, what, 2 and 12? But an average die roll requires a 12. Mm-hmm. For for uh, super folks, yeah. No, no, that, that's for anybody. An average die roll is is a twelve. Oh, if we scroll back up, the thing is, is you're going to have bonuses to those yeah, rolls. Yeah, your bonuses because of skills and whatnot. Yes. Yeah. The uh yeah with skills uh your body mind uh soul. Yeah, your your stats. Oh, oh, yep. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, there I you go. There. Stats. You remembered. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> 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 I keep wanting to call it attributes, and I know it's wrong in this game, so I'm like, uh, anyway, the range of di- uh, dice. See, now he went back to dice. <laughs> the range of die rolls produces a triangular distribution, a cousin to the bell curve, with the middle value of seven generated most frequency, one sixth of all rolls. Sure. I mean, and we we know that. I mean, two d six. The average roll of two d six is seven. I mean, there you yeah. go. It's just what it is. It's math. Rules are made throughout the game to determine the success or failure of important actions performed by the player characters or by the NPCs interacting with them. Rules are only needed for actions where the character's success is uncertain. By the way, some people might complain, okay, he already said that before. Yeah, but you might only be reading in this paragraph when you're looking something up and not previously. So I don't mind the redundancy. In fact, I kind of wish more games would include redundancy. The GM can decide that an action succeeds or fails without a role, and many routine or minor actions should be resolved this way. And we already covered that. If the GM decides a die roll is required, <laughs> that going back and forth. I'm sorry, I'm not Canadian. I have a hard time with this. Uh, the player rolls two dice and adds the relevant stat, combat value, or attribute level modifier to the number rolled. So all that stuff pops on in. The resulting sum is called the total roll. The higher the total roll, the better the character's attempt. The total roll is compared to either the target number or opposed roll. So target number is like the 12, right? For an average. Sure. An opposed Six, nine, roll, 12, whatever. Yep. An opposed roll is when Heathen Dog rolls and I roll and we see who gets higher. Yep. And that's how you determine uh, if the task was successful. I am not going to read who rolls the dice. Basically, players do most of the time, but if the GM needs a secret roll, the, play, uh, the GM does. There you go. And he, once again, here are the target numbers. Inconceivable. Um, come on, zoom in. There you go. The success of most non-combat roles is determined by comparing them to a target number. The GM assigns a task under consideration a target number before the roll is made. If the total roll is equal to higher than the target number, the task succeeds. If it's lower, it fails. Oh, what about equal? I'm sure it's a threshold, right? If the GM assigns the, t- if the total roll is equal, yeah, it says if the total roll oh, is equal, equal to or higher. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Did I not say that? I don't think I, I didn't hear equal to. Okay. But if I didn't be- say it, I meant to, because I was I was picturing it as equal in my head. That's why you stumped me. I was like, oh shit, did I read it wrong? <laughs> like, 
Uh, GM usually tells the players the task target number before the player rolls. Eh, it depends. Yeah. Well, actually, if it's against, so my take on this, if it's against something static, like programming an application, uh, picking up a car, picking a lock, picking a lock, then yes. Sure. If it's something like combat, I generally don't. But usually Not, combat's going to be a resisted roll, so... Right. I would have. I personally would have you both roll at the same time. Yeah. But, but even in, like, Dungeons & Dragons, I don't give the armor class of the monsters. You have to figure that out. Now, we can just figure it out once we go around the table one time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can. Yeah. And you know what? When your warrior is clubbing things and your wizard isn't, you kind of have an idea of, you know, of, of how well that, that combat's going to go for you. If you've spent two rounds and your warrior still hasn't hit... And you notice that he was rolling pretty well on that on that die. Bad things are happening. Bad things are happening. <laughs> so, so yeah, you can figure it out. But I'm just not going to give you the direct number. A lot of times, it's because I change things too. So anyway, instead of setting a specific target number, the GM may decide that a task requires an an opposed role. This is appropriate for any situation that involves a direct competition between opponents, such as arm wrestling. Arm wrestling is just the easiest one to go to. I know everyone does it. Everyone gives it as an example because it's the easiest. It absolutely is the easiest. Yep. A game of chess, an interrogation, or combat. In an opposed role situation, the two or more characters involved each roll their own dice. The character with the higher total roll succeeds. There you go. Roll high. Got it. Margin of success. <laughs> We're just going to move on here. We don't have to... I, I, this is a longer chapter than I thought it was going to be, so uh, I'm not going to skip things that are relevant, but... I think we get the the point of post rolls at I, that point. You know what? Uh, speaking of margin of success, but before you explain it, I am usually not a fan of margin of of, of success stuff. I'm usually okay. not a fan. I like the whole when I roll a die, it's a binary. It's a win or a loss. It's a good or a bad, and then move on from there. I want to control nuance. I don't want the dice to control the nuance of a game. Just the you know success or failure is fine. But let let's see how let's see how they work here. I, I differ with you on that, but in a nuanced way. I don't <laughs> I don't like partial successes. Yeah. That that stuff's annoying to me. If yeah. I made my role and I succeeded, then I succeeded. But I do like things like Earth Dawn, the the chart. A success, good success, ex uh, excellent success, extraordinary success. Now, that might be too many columns for people. You know, some people just like the success critical. I get that. But I do like that because what I think it allows for is, especially in investigations, how much information did you get? That's uh, for, for, for Earth Dawn, you had the armor defeating hit. Mm -hmm. You know, thing. Like, now we're talking the older editions. Yeah, and we're talking older editions of Earth Dawn. Modern version doesn't do that. But so... I'm okay with it as long as it isn't nuanced into like, you know, every 3% on a percentile die. <laughs> well, let's yeah. see how it works here. Yeah, right. Okay, most, uh, most die rolls produce binary results, success or failure. Sometimes it can be useful to know the degree or margin of success or failure as well. If the task was successfully completed, how successful was it? Conversely, if the task failed, how severe was the failure? The greater the difference between the character's die roll and the target number, or opposed role for contested actions, the greater the margin of success or failure, listed in 8.2. Okay, that really doesn't tell us much, but remember, this is an introduction for people possibly who have never done this before. Control, thank you. Uh, so, that's the understanding. Margin of success. Oh, there are lots of them. So, equals yeah, the target. A, a tie or slim success? Uh, slight success. Moderate success. So let's just look at this one because it says moderate. Moderate means, you know, in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. So roll exceeds the target by three to five. So if that target number is 12 and you roll a 15 to an 18, you got a moderate success. And then you have significant, major, extreme, monstrous success. Oh, were you taking something from, uh, from face rip there? I'm just wondering. Just, just yeah. asking. <laughs> uh, it doesn't tell. Yeah, it. it it apparently allows the game master to determine what those margins are. Cause I didn't, I didn't see an explanation of what a slim success or a tie or moderate or monstrous. What's the difference? It didn't say. So that guess that's up to the game master. Maybe we'll get to that at another section point. Um, we're going to 174 on this, uh, 
God, we got a lot more to do. Oh my God. Yeah, so, so we're gonna oh, combat is gonna be the sure. next vid that's gonna be the next video. Oh, okay. Oh my god, we got a lot. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get going. All right, there are five types of roles. We're gonna skip those paragraphs and we're gonna just go to stat roll. <laughs> A stat roll is used when the GM believes that innate ability is more important than any learned expertise or combat capability in resolving the success of a particular action. An example of a stat roll would be a body stat roll to smash through a locked door using brute strength. Another important use for a stat roll is to see if a character can resist the effects of something bad, such as mind control, poison, or shock. I didn't even think about this. Have you been watching chat to get uh, comments later? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, the GM decides which stat, body, mind, or soul, is being tested by the action or situation. And you can look at the stat descriptions later. For stat rules that relate to an attribute, the relevant stat is often provided in the attribute's description. If the GM feels that two or three stats are closely related to an action, remember, it's got a Venn diagram that you can deal with, right? Mm -hmm. An average stat value can be calculated. This is exactly how combat works. Uh, rounding up to the closest whole number. The success. Okay, so here we go. Total roll equals die roll plus stat value. All, all, all this, everything we're reading here comes down to this right here. Remember, total roll is the final result, right? So sure. if your die roll, if, can, can you just roll two d six, and we're gonna say your stat value is uh is four. I don't care. Just two d six plus four. Okay, that is ten plus four, fourteen. Okay, he rolled a ten on the two d six. He mm -hmm. had a stat value of four, so his total roll was 14. Got it? All right, we can move got on. got a now. moderate success, usually. <laughs> he got a moderate success, if we were considering success levels, yes. Yeah. Uh, da -da -da. So, a character's attributes or defects, like, what are those? Well, we talked about those last time. So, you can look back in the previous videos. A character's attributes or defects can sometimes modify stat rolls. For example, the mind shield attribute adds plus two per level to the mind stat rolls when resisting psychic intrusion. So, let's just use Keaton Dog's roll that he had a moment ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, he had 10 plus four, but he also gets a plus two stat bonus. Now it's 10 plus six. So, he had a 16. For every level go. of mind shield. So, if I had yeah. three levels of mind shield, I get a plus two per level. So that'd be plus that, six. That'd be plus six. So, so I would have got 10, a 20 at that yeah, point. 10 plus four plus six would be 20. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, the tri-stat system, if you're not into simulationism, the tri-stat system is good. If you're into more simulationism, well, you're going to want to go somewhere else because it's meant to be quick and dirty, simple, and let's move on to keep this, you know, I think in its own words, keep the story going. When more than one character applies the same stat in a manner that would be additive, one character is considered the leader of the effort. This is like when helping each other. Yeah. Often the character with the highest stat and the other characters are helpers. That's just that's the way every game does it. Just mm -hmm. the character with the highest stat. Hulk does not help um, who's somebody that's weak. Rogue. I don't even care if I'm mixing genres. I really don't care. Uh, yeah, yeah, Hulk, good, Hulk does not uh, uh, does not help Rogue. Okay, Hulk is the one that's rolling and somehow rogues helping him that's rogue, how it's well, going to be. It, it, it depends on which version of rogue one, one, uh, a lot of them have super strength but definitely not as strong as hulk hulk is the main strength in this one right right <laughs> there you go uh and the leader receives a minor edge which we'll cover in a moment on the stat roll so remember that if you're a helper you can uh, give a minor edge so skill rolls here we go total roll is dice roll plus stat value plus skill group level now we talked about those last time or time before i forget mm -hmm. remember skill group level is an attribute All right skills like everything else your character can, character can do are attributes skill group level in this case would mean if you're a detective and you got some detective skills and you're doing your detecting you're doing that grid pattern that, uh, that you're talking about you would roll probably mind uh, or sorry, uh, die roll. So you two d six plus your mind plus the skill group plus uh, search or whatever well, whatever, whatever what, skill you have. That's what the skill group is. Yeah, search. So I have let's say uh, for you use, using the using the stuff before. I have a die roll plus my mind stat, which is say four. And but I have I have a level three search for weird artifact. So I would add my die roll plus four plus three. And that would be my total roll. 
One of the things to, to note is uh, he thugs right, but for the purposes of this game, just to be pedantic for a moment here so that people don't get concerned, skill groups are literally that. It's like the detective skill, and you get everything that comes with it. Yeah, I mean, search, search for, I, I said search for stupid artifact. It's search yeah. for anything. It's just search. Right, right. Looking for stuff. You know, like shadow surveys the scene means a lot, right? Searching for, looking for everything, looking for clues, looking for everything. It, it, it covers it all. And the reason the game does that is so that you don't need to have a, a list of 500 skills and you pick no. and choose. It just says, you're a detective, you can do detective things. Yeah, this is your, this is your detective skill group. Whenever you're detecting, this is <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> all right, uh, skill synergy. It is possible for a character to have two or more skill groups that work well together during a specific task, such as technical and scientific skill groups when trying to bypass complex biomechanical lock. If the GM allows multiple skill groups to assist in a task, the character makes a skill roll using the skill group ranked at the highest level, gaining a minor edge, again we will cover that in a moment, on the roll for one synergistic skill group or a major edge for two or more synergistic skill groups. That'd be one of those things to negotiate with your game master, but don't argue with him. No, no, no. Just, just say your case and let it go. For example, in that example there, it said a biometric lock. That means there's at least two skill groups that will come in handy, a medical skill group and some kind of lock picking skill group. Both of those would be appropriate. You can either just pick the lock or you can try and, and, and spoof the, the biometrics or you can combine the skills and do both. And that's what will give you a possible minor or a possible major edge. But if the game master says no, it does not going to work like that, then you move on. That's it. Just and just make sure, you know, game masters, you stare, you're fair, reasonable, and consistent. Combining skill roles is the same thing as above. Uh, you can get a minor edge if you help somebody to, you know, if you're that scientist and you have the same skill group as him and you put your two noggins together, you can get a minor edge. Unskilled attempts. Uh-oh. Now you don't have any clue how to do anything biomechanical. Often a character will attempt an action for which to do not possess the relative skill group. The approach in these situations is dependent on the nature of the action. A familiar action. Characters, if the character is undertaking a familiar action, yet lat lacks a relevant skill group, make a stat roll instead of a skill roll. Skill roll. I would say in the case of driving, you know, if yeah. you grow up around car, maybe in New York City this isn't true, but you know, if for most of us, when we turned 15 and got our learner's permit, we knew where the gas pedal was. We knew how to put it into gear. Hell, back in the day, we sat on dad's lap and, dro and drove or mom's lap and drove, you know. Hey, come on, there's not much traffic. Come on over here and drive. You know? <laughs> Try that nowadays. You're going to prison. But, uh, uh, you know, so you kind of already had an idea what's going on. So as long as you're not doing anything weird, yeah, just, you know. You're, you're probably going to make it to the store and back. <laughs> you might. Yeah. Hopefully it's not a stick shift, but yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. Stop one time in the intersection because you did, or or, or two hundred yards away from it because you didn't realize how the brakes work, but you get it. <laughs> um, all right. Da, 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 who cares about that? The player can explain familiar. Okay, unfamiliar action. If the character is undertaken action in which he's unfamiliar, the task should be treated as a normal stat roll, but with minor or major obstacle. We'll talk about those when we talk. About, hey, what the hell? This is this is something like. Uh... You've never seen wow. or used an iPhone before. You've only used Android or vice versa. And you, you pick up that thing. You have absolutely no idea where anything is on that. You have absolutely no idea how any of this stuff works. You have no idea what these icons mean. It's going to take you a minute. And you're probably going to fail at first. By the way, to Skami, awesome PDF. I mean that. I accidentally I meant to highlight something here. And I clicked where it said page 172. But it brought me to page 172. That's how you make a PDF, sir. Uh, stat roll, the, as we said, with a minor or major obstacle applied to the role, depending on how much the GM feels training is required and how background aspects of character. Sure. Required skill. The GM may decide certain tasks automatically failed when performed by characters lacking the required skill. This is the example I always Brain use. Surgery. Well, I, I use the landing an aircraft. If you are on an aircraft and you and the, and the pilot and co-pilot jump... <laughs> <laughs> you know they're not there and you go and you sit in that cockpit and you try to land it well i'm glad i have a last will and testament yeah it's probably gonna go bad <laughs> but hey you know what it, it's better than definitely going bad 
there, there there's really no harm in trying at that point right yeah there's hope yeah. right <laughs> not much <laughs> brain surgery is another good one yeah brain surgery uh, is, is one that you 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 if you don't have training and it, it's probably a good idea not to even try because the result is he's probably going to die quicker all right now we're on initiative rolls getting towards the end of this uh we've got a couple pages left Initiative rolls are a special type of role made by participants at the start of a combat scene to determine the order in which they will act. I don't know what this book is going to say. We're going to find out in a moment, but I am a, I don't want to say a stickler. I don't like it when people overuse initiative and in combat rounds. I mean, you play your, the game at the table the way you want, but if heathen dog, if I'm describing a scene, right? All right, heathen dog, uh, you got up on top of the roof and you can see that the, the two guards are below and he's setting up his sniper action. Right. And he's like, OK, I'm going to snipe those two guys. Sure. Bare minimum for the first one. I go first. Yeah, there is no initiative role. No, I just go first. Right. Barring anything that could tip him off or something. But then he would have tripped that already. And then he should be worried if I said roll initiative. Wait, what? Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, right. What? Why? What? <laughs> not everything requires an initiative role. It only matters. Initiative only matters when it matters who goes first. And typically the person who says he's going to do something first goes first. Especially if the other people don't know he's there. Exactly. Uh, it's just one of those mistakes that I've seen over the years. And I used to do it too. I'm not going to lie. I used to do it too. Uh, where it's like, well, you're trying, you're trying to hit him. Okay. Roll initiative. But when you think about it, it's like, it doesn't even make sense to roll initiative. So what if he wins? I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> so he isn't expecting the attack, right? You know, things like that. Uh, anyway, uh, each participant in the battle makes an initiative roll using the sum of the two dice plus attack combat value after modification by specific attributes and defects, which we talked about previously. So let's just look at it down here. Total roll equals die roll plus attack combat value plus any applicable bonuses. Yeah, and if, if you look at the at the uh, uh, visual aid that we saw earlier, uh, you you know exactly what what your ACV is. You roll up to all the all the pretty pictures. There you go. Uh, there's actually an initiative one. Here it is. There it is. A ACV plus ACV dice. Plus dice. So then the then... ACV is uh, ACV plus attack attributes plus dice. Well, that, the... uh, that's that's for attack and defense, but yeah. it's just ACV plus dice for initiative. And lightning reflexes give a major minor edge. Right. So and uh, ACV is what? It's your uh, agility plus... Oh. Uh, it's it's a, it's body plus... Um, I think it's body plus soul. I th body, you think so? Okay. I, I, I forget what which one ACV is. Yeah, I, 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 thought, I thought DCV was body, but I could be wrong. Definitely could be wrong. I, I'm forgetting at the moment. Does it say up here? Did it, am I say? <laughs> it's been a few weeks since we covered that, folks. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think it says on there. Yeah, it doesn't. No. But... You can look up, you'll have it on your character yeah, sheet. You'll have it on your character sheet. When when your character is made, your ACV and DCV are static. They're there. It's, they they, they are they are a derived statistic from from your powers and 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 your main stats. So there you go. You have it. There it is. Well, it's, right all, it's all three. Nice. It's all okay. It's all three in the combat, in the, combat in the value, Venn diagram. Attack and defense is all three. Body, mind, and soul <laughs> averaged averaged together plus whatever uh, abilities. Uh, you have, you know, be it be it powers like you know, li lightning reflexes give, gives you a bonus, attack but, mastery, uh, defense uh, mastery, attack mastery or defense mastery will also give you a greater ACV or, or or DCV total, and it's written on your character sheet. So you roll the die plus plus your ACV, boom, that's your initiative. Two two dice, and then the ACV that's your initiative. And we talked about it right now a lot longer than you'll ever have to worry about it. Yeah, in the game. yeah, it's so very our, simple. Our explaining it took ten times longer than just doing it. So there you go. Uh, beyond two dice. All right. Here are the edges and obstacles. Sometimes an attribute enhancement limiter or defect provides distinct changes to your character's die rolls known as edges and obstacles. These modifiers shift the probability distribution of the dice away from a symmetrical triangular distribution that has a value of seven in the middle to an asymmetrical skewed curve as shown on page 166. And that was a little chart that I showed. We're not going back to it. No, no. Why? For example, 
<laughs> well, there are people there are people that really want that. There is a free league book where somebody was freaking out because uh, they didn't put the percentage chance in there of the uh, of the D6 dice pools. So every free league game has the percentage chance of not push not pushing a roll or pushing a roll in there because apparently that's important to people. I think it personally, I think it's silly. This is a role playing game, not a war game. I don't want to play math finder important to you it's important enough to push if it doesn't don't yeah right that's it that's all that's all it should be you know but and hey some some people like like the whole uh uh when 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 they're when they're playing blackjack they have to bring that card to the table to to make the most efficient plays every time if you're that guy good luck role playing games aren't for you i don't yeah, care i don't, like, know, I don't I... know what to tell you but you, you you're not there to have fun you're there to win and <laughs> that's not how you're supposed to do it that's what I got yelled at for on Friday. Basically, it was uh, and I said things like, "Role playing games aren't for you. You're for, you play war games. War games are for you. Board oh, games, definitely, yes. And, war games and are board for games. You. We're not talking Candyland. There's some really intense board games out there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, there's there's Risk or Axis and Allies where you do not start a fight un unless the math yep. is in your favor. Uh, you know, or or you just lose everything. And modern board games are so. <laughs> I showed it up, and I have ether fields. I still can't figure the game out. <laughs> it's boxes upon boxes of like, what's going on here? Uh, anyway, so uh, for example, a character with an, el an elasticity attribute receives a minor edge on unarmed attack rolls to express flexibility advantage. Conversely, a weapon with the inaccurate limiter assigned twice gives the character a major obstacle. All right, so what does that mean? What does that do? What is uh, major I guess minor? we're going over here. Minor edges and obstacles. When a minor edge or obstacle is applied to a roll, you roll three dice instead of the normal two. You add together the two highest numbers. So this is... Oh, both. okay, okay. It's the whole oh. 3d6 drop one. Yep. Okay, drop so, the So for an edge, you discard the lowest. And for an obstacle, you discard the highest. The highest. Okay, copy that. So, so you uh, they give an example here. If you roll three dice that come up as one, three, and six, the final roll result from a minor edge would be nine, because you'd use the three and the six, the two highest, drop the one, that's nine. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for a minor obstacle would be a four, because you'd keep the two drop lowest, one and three, and drop right. that six that's now laughing at you. Yep. Copy that. <laughs> Makes sense. What about Maj majors? Majors. When a major edge or obstacle is applied to a roll, you roll four dice instead of just oh, the normal two. Wow. That's okay. You add together the two highest numbers for a major edge and you uh, two lowest numbers for a major obstacle. So okay. we'll do the example thing again. It should be clear to folks, but just in case, if you roll four dice that come up as two, two, three, and five, the final result for a major edge would be eight, three plus five. And for a major obstacle would be four, two plus two. Right. And then after that, that's when you add in your stats, all your other stuff that you would your add in. Or, or skill groups or whatever, whatever other bonuses you have that the edges and obstacles only affect your die roll. Right. Not, not, not your skill groups or your stats or, or, or whatever. That's all added on at the end after your die roll to get your total roll. Right. Now, Think about that for a moment, because if you're a superhero that gets like, you know, plus 10 to the roll. OK, whatever. Now, I wouldn't say whatever, it. but it is going to hinder your that success level. Uh, yes. But, yes. But it does. Or, or if, if it's a very heroic target number, yep. you, you may want to change the circumstance of your role before you do it. Like, uh, for example, if, if you have a, a, a 50 caliber sniper rifle, but you don't have a tripod for it, you're going to take. A, a minor or major obstacle in firing it because you're not steady. You'd want to get something to steady the, the weapon on before you fire it to eliminate those obstacles. If Agreed. you really need to make that shot. And that that's happens through good role-playing and good character. Yeah. I, I don't want to call it description. Character narration, not about trying to add your plus. This is what I like about the tri-stat system. It's hard to put together the plus ones and plus twos because there aren't a lot of rules that talk about plus ones and plus twos outside of your specific character powers. It's up mm -hmm. to the game master to determine how difficult something is. 
I like I, I'm I'm pro that. I, I think that's a good thing. I don't want people going through a list of charts in a book to find out, well, if I stand on top of a hill, that's a plus one. If I hide behind yeah, a tree, yeah. it, it, it it is it is a lot better than than ha having to go through, okay, well, because of this, this, and this, you have a plus three here, minus two to that, plus yes. four and minus five. Now I gotta get the final adjustment result. No, it's just like okay, uh you have a bonus, minus, and a bonus. Okay, that is a that is a um uh what do you call it? an obstacle that one is the the not what's the uh, i forget edge. edge edge obstacle edge so it's netted one obstacle or or you just change the difficulty or, to something better i mean it, it depends yeah. on the Whatever. situation Whatever. You, yeah. You, yeah yeah you you don't have to do a lot of math you just count up okay do i have more obstacles and edges yeah okay well then well then you're you're taking 3d6 minus the you know dr drop the highest one there you go I mean, in my head, the way I see it is if I'm rolling four, uh, four dice, I'm basically, I don't know if this, this average is right, but I'm just looking at, I've got a much higher chance of getting three and a half and three and a half, you know, to, so that'll cancel out some ones and twos. Or, or you could like me, you know, if it's a, I just rolled four dice. If I have a major edge, I just got a 12 because I got two sixes and two threes. But well, if I had a, a major obstacle, I would have a six because mm -hmm. it's just the two threes added to my stat or my skills or whatever yep. to get my total roll at the end. But that, that is a, that is a big jump. I mean, a major obstacle and major edge is a big jump. Do not underestimate it. Especially you at want, lower powered. Exactly. You, you want to either, you know, put yourself in a situation where you have an edge and take away a situation where you have an obstacle, but that's uh, up to you and, and your tactical role play and your game master and your game master. Fair enough. Now, what about multiple edges and obstacles? Occasionally, situations may arise during the game in which more than one edge or obstacle applies to a die roll. A common occurrence when using optional rules from Chapter 9, which we have not come to yet. For these situations, consider the following guidelines. Two major... Two minors equals a major. I think we already okay. came across that anyway. Yep. And opposites cancel each yep. other out. Okay. Yep. I, I guessed that earlier. Yep. Yep. Okay. That just makes sense. We're not even going to read yeah. it. Yeah. That just makes uh, perfect sense. It's fine. An opposite minor reduces a major. Okay, sure. so yeah, so you'd go yeah, from so, so if you have a, if a major edge and a minor obstacle, turns into a minor edge. Right. Copy that. Opposed roles may take spillover. Okay, what is that? What is this that? I don't okay, know. Yep, let's find out. For opposed roles such as in combat, a modification that goes beyond a major obstacle or edge can apply reverse modifier to the opponent. Oh no, role. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. For example, if an attacker gains both a major edge and a minor edge to the roll, only the major edge applies. Okay, if an attacker gains both a yeah, major... Yeah, if, if, okay, no, do, do it this way, do it this way. Oh, you I, have, I, 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 see, I see what's yeah, going you on. You see it now? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what they're trying to do is because I have over a major already, that, that you can't, means... You're not going to be rolling my, seven dice. My <laughs> awesome circumstance not only gives me the, the the two highest out of four, but it makes him have a minor obstacle because I've overflowed over to his role. Yeah. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Your your awesome success does not take away from my ability to roll my dice. Screw you. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. This is uh, only the major edge applies and the minor obstacles opposed to, uh, on the opposing roll, the defender in this example, simply max out one roll at the major edge or obstacle and apply any secondary modifiers to the opposing roll as an inverse effect. I don't Sim like that at all. Simply max out one roll at the major edge. Oh, okay, I got it. For, I, I was thinking like, oh, so you automatically get a six in there? No, no, no. It's just no, saying no. it just yeah, max it out as a major edge. Is is rolling four dice, taking taking the highest two. That's the best you can get. Any more merits or or uh, or uh, edges that you have are obstacles to your opponent of the of the opposed roll. I, I may be like wrong that. in this, but I don't know if it was in the TriStat core book or if it was in Bessem, but I could have sworn in those, and, I, and somebody can correct me in chat if I'm wrong or in the comments later, but I could have sworn in those, one of those books, if not both of them, you could have like 60, 66. I don't, rem I don't remember this rule, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, but I, 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 don't, I don't like one person's good fortune or planning. Uh, taking away somebody else's good fortune or planning i don't like yeah, but, that but you're, edges already, don't... you're already getting a major edge suck it up all right you're, yeah, but you're edges don't well. come from planning generally speaking i shouldn't say they can't but they generally don't they come from your your attributes 
like the lightning reflexes or whatever. Well, so also, planning you know, is going to be more on the difficulty side. You know, steadying or aiming or or whatever or or uh, get, getting the high ground, Anakin stuff like that can give you an edge as well. I thought that was under difficulty, but okay. Um, this is one of the problems with games that use both uh, dice modifier oh, modifiers to numbers and modifiers to the number of dice you roll. Yeah, usually I I try to pick one or the other. Yeah. Okay, multiple edges can allow rerolls. An alternative to the spillover rule above that Heathen Dog hates, each mm -hmm. minor edge applied to a roll that already benefits from a major edge is converted to one optional immediate reroll instead. Uh, Similarly, an additional major edge converts to up to two optional rerolls, just like for the mulligan attribute. All, all dice must be rerolled should that option be carried out, and not just the selected undesirable dice values. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that. See the the whole uh, having having more more than more than a major edge. It's I just drop it. It doesn't matter. Major edge is strong enough. It's strong enough. You don't need you don't need to have spillover nonsense. It's just now, I wonder, more, what, more I wonder what the reason the is as to why it just didn't add more dice. I know it could get cartoonish at some point. It was like if you synergize your character perfectly that you're rolling like 10 dice. But I mean, you are a superhero, so I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, so I get it, you know. And plus, see all these D6s right here? This, you know, this costs like 15 bucks. You can get 36 D6s. So it's not like you're running out of dice. Yeah, but uh, like somebody in chat just said, he doesn't like rolling more than four dice. So I mean, hey, I get I, that too. I, I get that too, and that that's why the spillover stuff is like just just drop it, man. Just drop it. You don't need that crap of affecting other people's rolls, re-rolling your dice constantly. It's just slowing down game, gameplay or complicating gameplay, in my opinion. And well, I, let's I let's heathen dog. Let's for a moment, drink some coffee for a second. Let's assuage you right now. Okay, all right. Maxing out at major is fine. Oh, good. It's, like it's also a reasonable alternative to ignore any modifiers that would exceed a major edge or obstacle, regardless of the number of modifiers that apply. There you go. Thank you, game. I, I appreciate you agreeing with me. <laughs> and so, it agrees with you as well. Look. Yeah, well, the, the, the whole the whole idea here is uh, is you have uh, what I like about this. Remember, it says at the beginning of the book, this is not a law book. It's a manifesto, which I don't know if that's a good word to use, but it's, it's a manifesto, not, not a law book, right? So there are options here. And honestly, one of the things I like, I know some people, they can know I have to know the right way. I'm actually seeing this going on a Discord right now where they're arguing over the legitimacy of like dotted I's and cross T's. I hate that nonsense. I like something here that builds a framework for the game master, or in this case, a little more than a framework. This is given options for the game master. Just pick it. fair reasonable consistent move on that's all you got to be all right exceeding two dice is a possibility finally your group may wish to turn every minor edge or obstacle into one extra die rolled and every major into two dice okay which is added to the two dice that are normally rolled for example if two minor and two major edges would apply to a single roll instead the player would roll a total of eight dice wow i mean i love dice pools man um I, I just I would have to know how it affects the game though. That's that's really well. What no, no, it, would... it doesn't matter if you roll eight dice, twelve dice, twenty dice. You're still only taking the top two. You know, if you're right. You're right. Or you're right. or the bottom two, <laughs> which if you're rolling twenty dice, it's probably going to be two sixes or two ones. That, that's probably <laughs> what it's going to be. <laughs> let's, fair, let's be fair. fair. That 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 well, is a good point. Good point. Uh, the two normal dice plus one for each of the two minors plus two for each of the two majors. Again. You do the math above and then generate a final dice uh, roll total using the highest two dice value. So no matter what, yes, you're only you're only okay. going to get a maximum of 12 or a minimum of two with no matter how many dice d d dice you roll for all of these extra dice for major and minor obstacles and uh, edges. OK, last little part here. Hedging. Hedging your bets. At the GM's discretion, a player may eliminate the random element of a dice roll for the character by assuming an automatic result of seven instead of rolling the dice. Any attribute bonus, you know, a bunch of games just bad. Um, were you taking 10 or 20 or whatever it was called in, in the old D&D &D or D20 system, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other games do things like this. I've got to be honest with you, I don't like it. I don't. I, you know what? I, I kind of like this. Uh, especially if if you're a superhero and and you're fighting like a street level mugger right he's just a freaking mugger i'm spider-man he's a mugger he really has no chance to win 
to be fair. I mean, it, it would be it would be ridiculous if mugger number seven with a small knife is going to beat Spider-Man. It's not gonna happen. So I would say, hey, you know what? Uh if 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 you if you take your average roll of two dice, which is seven, just go ahead and do that and and you beat him. There you go. I mean, you're you're too strong, too skilled, too fast. He's just he's just a normal dude who didn't finish high school. I don't know what, yeah, but, don't but know that wouldn't even be a roll at that point. That that yeah. would just be you do it. I, I would. Well, no, um, you didn't roll. You just you said yeah, you you got a seven. You got the average. Yeah, I, I if you're going to roll dice, roll the dice. That that's my stand. And again, it's not about this game. I don't have any issues with this game. Other games do it as well. I'm of the mindset this would probably be one of those rules I take out. Uh, I just I'm not a I'm not a fan of it either. You're rolling dice or you're not. You know, picking a number. <laughs> <laughs> for your actions that just means you knew you're going to succeed anyway uh anyway any attributes bonuses or penalties still apply as normal adding to or subtracting from the seven result a character can use hedging on any role the gm permits including stat skill initiative attack and defense roles yeah. i like that because it allows the gm to say no if, if it's important like like you if it's important enough for a number it's important enough for a role yeah the hedging value of seven is increased to eight for a minor edge and nine for a major edge or decreased to six for a minor obstacle and five for a major obstacle. Mm. Mm. And uh, there'll be one little chart, but this is the last thing we're going to cover. Though even the game master, though even game masters enjoy rolling dice, they also may wish to speed task resolution when NPCs are involved. This can apply during combats between player characters and the, the, the last... the. The, the, I will stand up on a mountaintop and say you never, ever, ever allow hedging in combat. I, I, yeah. Somebody's skill, you generally, and Alexander McCreese made a good, a good uh, uh, rationale for this. When you do a skill, like, you know, I work in IT, used to work in IT, you, you generally know the capability of somebody in that. You know that the person can fix. Now, yes, can you resolve something that's complicated or botch something, you know, because you weren't paying that's attention? Easy. Yes, but the chances are you're going to hit that bell curve. Sure. But combat is a scrum. Combat is chaotic. Um, Everything uh, can happen. You could trip on a rut. Shut up. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not saying that Bruce Lee would lose to me. I'm just saying that, you know, uh, when possible. two fight... Mm. When two fighters in the MMA, you know, ring are fighting, different things, you know, their skills are matched. You don't. Well, he's been fighting. There, there, for... there is no clear victor. You're right. both trained. You're 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 both conditioned to be in that ring. Yeah. There is a chance either one of you could win. Right. Yeah. But so in, I, I don't I, like I hedging would, for combat. Yeah. I I would use this this NPC hedging for for things like a. Uh, uh, the the bad guy hid something in this room. I don't I don't feel like rolling for all this stuff. So I'm I'm going to hedge the NPC stuff. He got a total of thirteen. That that is your target number to to find the thing. Stuff like yeah. that. I would I would I would do that. All right. Um, we're gonna look at a. Uh, uh, so here we go. Superhero action. Now this is going to be. For combat a little bit i kind of dives into the next uh video but since we started with uh initiative here you got start combat if ready actions okay this is all gonna be actually you know what? let's stop here i guess this Linear is all for optional next. combat rules yeah these are all gonna be for the next one when we get into combat which to be yeah. fair shouldn't be so long because i'm skipping a big section of it okay um all right so all what right. do we have for comments what do we got comments we have uh daryl eret I guess uh, too many levels of success. I wouldn't want to consult a chart. Yeah, there was a lot of levels of, of success and, and levels of failure. There really shouldn't be that many. In, in my opinion, I agree with them. There's I many. generally agree, but uh, I like, I like charts. I think uh, charts belong in games and people need to use more charts. That's one of the things that I'm really annoyed with modern gaming is they're always trying to remove charts. no, doesn't hurt the game to look at a chart, but the chart has to be meaningful. Number one, yeah. this chart didn't define what any of that stuff was. No, so Therefore, it doesn't matter. Not meaningful. <laughs> yeah, it did, that chart didn't matter at all. Secondly, there were too many on there as yeah. well. Uh, I feel I get what he was not going for. Chart. Yeah, it not it was not a good chart in my opinion as well. And Darius twenty eight says uh, we've 
uh, have had GMs use cutscenes by giving reasons to view a video or mentally inserted memory. Oh. I've used cutscenes too for for uh, uh, th things like pre and post cognition stuff like that. You know, in, especially in superhero games, you might have that. You know, but but the whole re reviewing the security tapes is a is a really good way of of uh, of creating a, a scene that you can see everything and hear everything that happens, but you weren't there. So yeah, I like that too. Uh, Coco Shuko says, "This is giving me a math boner." Yes. That, well, here's the problem. That's bad on us then, because TriStat and I've seen a couple other comments talk about like, "Whoa, this what's going on?" TriStat is crazy simple. It's yeah. just the way it's worded and the way we're describing. If you look at the character sheet, you're rolling two d six. Here, let me go to the end. Oh, I'm not showing anything here. No, you're not showing. Uh, it. It's fine. You're, you're rolling two d six plus your stat plus your skill and that's it yeah do they do they have sample characters at the beginning here right i could have sworn there were templates just one there we go i don't even care what it is all right so let's just say that uh the psychic or this cognition i'm guessing that's mind we're just going to go with mind all right so level three you're rolling 2d6 and for whatever reason because we're making up numbers right now just looking at this you're going to know what it is when you read your stat when you read your attribute, sorry, exactly what it gives you. But level three is generally plus three. Although, oh, no, no. You had that one that gave plus two per level, mind right? That mind shield. Mind shield. Plus two per level. Yes. There you go. Here's mind shield right here. Uh, does he have it over here? Plus, so plus two per level. So there's six. So you're rolling 2d6 plus six. It's, it's plus, that plus your actual mind stat adds to that. Does it? It does. Yes. Okay. So, and it even says right here, plus six roll to resist. So you don't even have to do the math. It's just little, or uh, you don't have to do extra math. It's yeah. right there, plus six. So it is really, really simple. The thing is, is the game is done in the same way as like Hero System or Champions, where you've got, uses different terminology, but you've got all these point systems and things going on. And sometimes I think that, uh, you know, Mark McKinnon reminds me of, of uh, Kevin Simbita uh, in a little bit different mentality or sometimes a little bit more fluff in the rules than needs to be. <laughs> but it's very simple. It really is. It's very, very simple. And then when you go to the character sheet, oop, uh, where was it? Oh, it's about me. What hell of an index? Do you look at look at all this stuff? That's this huge. is a, this is a man's index. <laughs> That's that that is that is a beefy index right there. Uh, there you go. I mean, everything's right here. Boom, boom, boom. You have all your multipliers right there. You're ready to go. Mind, body, soul. You just put the number in there, and then your level and your attribute over here. Boom, you're done. Now the defects, as we talked about last time, in a little can add some nuance to that, but you'll have that written down. Boom, you're there. You're ready to go. You're ready to play. So. Yeah, don't let our either his his writing or our bad explanations <laughs> <laughs> make make it seem like it's harder than it is because it's not. Uh, anything else? Nope, that is it. Okay, there is a couple more I want to look at here. Can you put up that one from uh, uh, Cygos, the last one from Cygos? Uh, yep. So this this drives me crazy. This is something that you and I couldn't disagree on more. Dice do not slow down games ever. It's role playing game. The game aspect is there. And I argue, I contend that Shadowrun first edition <laughs> with with its monstrous dice. That's is, why I have these 36 dice. That's why I got them for Shadowrun. It's awesome because there is this immersive anticipation as you're counting them up, trying to find this. Okay, did I do it? Did I do it? Did I do it? I love that feeling. I, now, yeah, I think Shadowrun actually gets too crazy, <laughs> but but um, I, I to me, you can't slow the game down when it's literally the game. Yep. Th that that's that's the issue I have with that. Now, can you slow pacing down for the narrative aspects? Yes, but I think that the people who do that, like the 4D crowd, forget that it is also a game. Now, I'm not arguing with you necessarily. I just have a different opinion on there. But there are some people I see that a lot. Like, oh my God, dice will slow the game down, dude. You're just rolling a d20. Well, it gets in the way of what? <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, so there we go. I think there's one more I wanted to get to, but I don't remember where it is. And um, I think it was on the Rumble side. Uh, yeah, let's just uh, 
I don't remember what the comment was, so we can move on. Okay. So, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, that segment felt like it was two hours to me, but actually it was just over one hour, so well, hopefully you learned everything you needed to know about how to roll dice. A uh, lot of words in there. I think that you're best served by just sticking with the couple of pages that show, you know, the nice little graphics on there. They can explain everything for you. All of the other stuff is one, it helps new players who have never played the game or the system before. And two, it just reminds game masters that you have options, but it really is a simple system. Some would argue too simple. But, you know, your mileage may vary on that. So hopefully you like that. Please leave your comments in the description. Or in the description. Oh, my God. <laughs> Please leave us a comment and refer to the description where you can support Legion of Myth. And I look forward to seeing you next time.